Thank you, Art. It's good to be in the house of God, is it not? It's good to have Art Peterson back uh, the last few weeks. This is our third Sabbath now, worshiping together collectively. And uh, it's been a little bit different. It's more streamlined, which has its blessings and its challenges. And it's been nice to have Art on the organ when we came in and also the special music. The prior special musics were all pre-recorded. So I'm glad you're here this Sabbath. My name is Pastor John. I want to welcome people that are watching online today. That will be posted on later on today. And I want to welcome each one of you today as we come to worship God. Today's sermon title is A Sight Worth Seeing. A Sight Worth Seeing. Let's start off with one more word of prayer. Dear Lord, we can never have too much prayer. Lord, we want to see you today. Not me, but we want to see you. May your portrait of Jesus Christ be hanging on the mantles of our lives, upon our hearts. Lord, there's many challenges. We're here to encourage each other, to pray for each other, to lift each other up, because there's many blessings that you have bestowed upon each of us. Lord, open our minds and our hearts. I know it's been a long week, a trying week, a blessed week. Lord, may we see Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Yesterday I was uh, celebrating my wife's birthday. And uh, it can be challenging to celebrate birthdays because she likes surprises. And this may be hard for you to believe, but I'm not always the most creative one when it comes to surprises. Sometimes I'm more matter of fact. Um, Christmas time, put it like for this, for Christmas time, I like to say what gifts I get. I like to know what I'm getting. I'm not huge on surprises. However, I found a place that I'd never taken her before and we took her out to eat and as we were sitting outside, it was a beautiful day. Were you guys outside yesterday? It was a beautiful day. We're sitting outside and we're eating. And then I notice a march coming down the street. Let's see if we have a picture of it. A march coming down the street. And I saw four people dressed in doctor's outfits carrying something that I thought was very unique. Richard, are you able to th show that slide? I tried to snap a picture off. Did you, get the, did you get the one, though, of the big nose? Oh, you didn't get it. All right, well, then I'll describe it. So four people in doctor's outfits carrying a huge nose. And then there was one person on the outside with this huge swab. And it was poking up in the nose. Go get tested. It's free. And at first I chuckled and I got a picture and it was all right. You know, it was sort of funny and free is always good, right? We like free. Who doesn't like free? But they kept standing on the corner where we're eating outside. And all I kept seeing is this huge nose going back and forth. And it's huge. It's gigantic. Nathan, it's bigger than you and me. Well, maybe, maybe just you. Maybe not me and you together. But it was huge. And they got this huge swab and they're going like this in the nose. And I told my wife, I said, you know, at the very end, I said, maybe I should just go make a video with them, you know, because we all will be tested. Will we pass the test of life? Hmm. You know, I'm always interested how people can come and hear the same sermon, but I hear feedback, different perspectives. Right? Right? Hearing the same, oh, well, there it is. There's that big nose. They got the signs in the mass. See the swab on the sign? And I mean, you can see that picture. I'm close to that. That nose was like almost over my food. And I'm glad they were wearing their masks. On the back of it said, their shirts, it said, free testing. And I think it's relevant today. We will all be tested but when I preach a sermon, I'm always interested on the feedback I get from the saints and from the visitors. And it's always interesting to see the different perspectives 
the different views, things that people have seen, and the things that people have heard. Same sermon, same church, same people, church family, I should say, but unique perspectives. So what's your thoughts about that? Well, Pastor John, it's a one-way conversation. I'm sorry, it is a one-way conversation here. But I want your thoughts to think. Think about that for a minute. Different perspectives. I've had people come up and say, Pastor John, that was the worst sermon I've ever heard. That same week, I had another person come up to me and said, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Same sermon, same pastor, same church, same family, different perspective. Now, my brother Russ is here, and he's preaching next week on the 23rd Psalms. Don't miss it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What is your perspective today coming in? Was it to see each other with masks on? Was it to worship? Was it to see old friends again? Was it spending time together collectively? Doesn't our perspective, isn't that our perspective, but often the same way with the box and the children's story, we see the box and we've already got you pinned how you are and what we think and the way you've lived. Know all about you. So this week I was going to an appointment up north and I was in my car and I was driving. I had some soothing Christian music on and I was in a good mood. It was a good day. The sun was shining I was uplifting the Lord, three-lane highway going north into Olympia. I'm in the center lane, so people coming onto the highway have room. People want to pass me have room. I mean, I'm right in the center lane, trying to be out of everyone's way. Then I came upon a car in front of me who was going much slower than me. So, believe it or not, my wife won't believe it. I don't always use my blinker. Forgive me, I'm not a perfect driver, but I'm a pretty good driver. I didn't. I put my blinker on. I did, baby. I went to the left lane to pass him. Now, you know, he's probably going 52, and I'm going about 57, and the speed limit's about 60. I brought Art, I was probably doing 61, but it's my story. So I'm doing still under the speed limit, 57, 58. And then all of a sudden, I look up in my mirror, and there's this car on my tail came from nowhere. I mean, it is on my tail. I'm afraid if I even let off the gas a little bit, it's going to be inside my car. Three lanes of traffic, then I see him slamming his brakes, go three lanes over, weaving in and out of the cars, and comes up next to me. And he waves at me, and he tells me I'm number one. Now... I'm sure you want to hold me up and say, what a good pastor you are, John. I'm sure you did the right thing. I'm thinking in my mind, you know, where's the police officer on the street right now to stop this guy driving like an idiot, right? Right? It's interesting with the police how when we want them to do certain things, I guess what I'm trying to say is I should be careful in the way I phrase this. It's our perspective where we want law enforcement, is it not? Remember that. So I'm thinking in my mind, all right, all right. I can follow him and we can have the road rage that I've often seen many times in my life. That never ends well. And then in my back of my head, I heard that still small voice that said, pray for him. What do you mean, Lord? Now the Lord and I are in a dialogue. What do you mean, Lord? I don't want to pray for him. He's not abiding by the law. He almost caused all these cars to wreck out. I'm not happy with this guy. Fine, I'm not going to chase him down. I'm not going to wave at him. But don't make me pray for him. I hear in the back of my mind, pray for him. It's interesting, in our cars, people take more liberalities than they would maybe walking on the sidewalk. But even then, I'm seeing more and more as I look at people's faces, anger. Matthew 24, the Bible says, the love of many will grow cold. So as he passed me and waved at me, that verse came to my mind. Look how cold he is. He doesn't know me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care that I'm trying to abide by the rules. Then another voice came into my mind and said, many will be offended. Same chapter, Matthew 24. Now I'm thinking about it. 
I'm the one being offended here. The love of many will grow cold, and many will be offended. Well, wait a sec. Now this applies to me? Now this is, it's applicable in my life? John, pray for him. Don't be offended. Pray for him. So I did. I handled it right, but I struggled with the challenge of what humanly I wanted to do or say or who to call. You guys have any challenges in the world we're living in right now? When I was young, I, uh, fifth grade, I went into the doctor because I was having problems seeing with my vision. I was a little slower with reading. Well, part of it was my vision. And I remember when I went in to the doctor, he put the sign up. Maybe Richard has that. I saw that. He has the sign up with all the letters. I'm sure you've seen it, right? All the letters. Now look at all those letters. F-P-T-O-Z, L-P-E-D, P-E-C-F-D, E-D-F-C-Z-P. I'm trying to impress my, my doctor here, who's my doctor, eye doctor. However, when I took, when I went and I was in fifth grade, I couldn't see the big E. That was the only letter I could sort of see. I guessed it, but I could barely see the big E. Would you say my perspective of the world was different than someone that was seeing 2020? Yes or no? Yes. You know, this year, 2020, was labeled Vision 2020. Did we have the vision what was going to happen this year? Do you remember December 31? New Year's Eve, the apples fall in New York. You have your different resolutions. I wonder what 2020 will bring. There'll never be another year like 2020, right? The perfect vision. Even we as Adventists labeled it Vision 2020. Did you see it coming? Did you see it happening? I couldn't see those letters. I barely could see the E. So the doctor said to my parents, he's going to need glasses. They didn't have LASIK back then. Glasses. That was like, all right, for the younger people... Your age is based on what you think. My wife turned, I can't say that. She said, don't embarrass her. My wife turned a year older. She made it very clear you're not old until you think you're old. So the children's story today, it was for all of you if you think you're young. I still think I'm young, but I feel old at times. So they told my parents, picture yourself now as a younger person. You got to wear those dorky glasses. I saw those kids in school that wore those glasses. I didn't want to be that kid in school that wore those glasses. Because other kids made fun of them based upon their appearance. Right? I begged my parents, please, I don't need to see that bad. I don't want to wear glasses. It's the worst thing ever. I don't want to go to school. I'll never have any friends or girlfriends. I won't make it in life. That's how I felt. It felt this big. Now, at my age now, I realize it was really more this big. However, for me, it was this big at that time. 2020 right now for me feels this big at this time. Looking back, I wonder what story someday we will tell others about 2020. Those goofy glasses I was going to have to wear. So I begged my parents. I pleaded with them. I may have even gone down on my hands and knees and said, please, is there any other option? Well, there was this little, like, plastic thing called a contact then. Please let me have those contacts. I'll do anything. Well, they're much more expensive. Please let me have them. Well, you have to. There's lots of maintenance and this and that. And if you lose it, then you're out those two to three, four hundred dollars. It's not like today where they give you a new one every day. My parents gave me those contacts. I didn't have to wear those glasses. But appearance means so much, does it not? And often we think, as we look at somebody, by the way they're dressed, by the way they look, by their job or the, not their job, by their title or maybe not their title, by their income or not their income, by their car or maybe not their car, their motorcycle, their bicycle, whatever they drive or not drive, 
we think we can pinpoint who that person is. Don't we? The guy that gave me the hand, he pinpointed on me for whatever he thought. I pinpointed him from some reckless driver who was crazy. Maybe he was going to an emergency. I gave him that benefit until he slowed down and he waved at me. And then he sped back up again. However, do we give other people the benefit of the doubt? Sometimes I have. I'm trying to. I want the benefit of the doubt. Don't you? Open up your Bibles with me. Let's go to a story. Let's see what the Bible has to say. Let's go to 1 Samuel. Let's go to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel, right after Ruth, chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16. It says, Now the Lord said to Samuel, God is speaking to Samuel. It's a good thing when God speaks to us. However, I'm always a little leery what he might say. How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him? from reigning over Israel. Okay, let's identify the players here. God is the God of the world. Samuel is who? 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 Prophet and a priest. Now who is Saul? The king over Israel. Israel is God's people. God said, I have rejected him for reigning over Israel. That's not the words that I would want to hear. Not even if I was Samuel, I wouldn't want to hear that. The king had the power to take lives and to give life. The king had all the power. And now he's telling Samuel, God is saying, I have rejected him. Now, let's use the Bible to answer why Saul is being rejected. Let's go to Samuel chapter 15. So for me, it's turning one page over. Samuel chapter 15, verse 10 and 11. Why is God rejecting Samuel? Chapter 15, verse 10 says, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, or rejecting Saul, I'm sorry. Now the, the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly regret that I've set up Saul as the king. God's going to elaborate here. For he, Saul, has turned his back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Two things stand out. Following God, a Christian is a follower of Christ, right? A disciple is a follower of God. Saul is not following God and he's doing something else, rejecting the commandments of God. All right, turn one page back over to 16. Put your bookmark, if you have a bookmark in there. How important are the commandments? Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. And let's talk just a little bit about are the commandments important? You know, as the guy drove by me in the car very fast, the laws were very important to me at that time. And the laws are still important to me today. They keep us safe. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, this is the last chapter in Ecclesiastes, in the last verses, which is really important because we often say the most important things last. On our dying bed, we'll probably say the most important thing lastly. I love my family. I love you. I'll never forget you. What is God saying in verse 13? Chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Partial matter, a little bit of the matter, just a piece of the matter. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. That's to follow God, right? Respect God. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. Not partial, man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. All right. 
going back now to Samuel. Saul rejected God. It came to light. He was not following God, and he was not keeping God's commandments. Let's see how God handles this. Chapter 16. Let's go back and let's just start from the beginning. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil to anoint the new king, and I am sending you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided myself, God has chosen a king among Jesse's sons. Verse 2, And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears me, he will kill me. But the Lord said, take a heifer, take an animal with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord, to worship the Lord. Then invite Jesse to show you what you shall do. No, it says, I will show you. God is now providing the light. I will show you what you shall do. Go first to God, and God will show you. Keep reading with me. You shall anoint for me the one I name to you. Now, if you remember how Saul was picked back in the day, he won many victories, many battles. He was very tall. He was handsome. The people wanted a king. Remember that? Israel wanted a king. What they missed was God was their king. They were a nation that had a king, which was the God of heaven, but they said, I want to be like everybody else. My perspective is, I want to be like that person over there. What's that mean? I want a king just like they have a king. All right? You pick your king. They pick Saul. Now God is picking his king. What's what's God's? What's he looking for? What's God's perspective? Key verse 4, Samuel did what the Lord said. He followed. He went to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled at his coming and said, do you come peaceably? This is a man of God. They're worried. Do you come peaceably? And he said, he said, yes, peaceably. I have come to sacrifice and worship to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me and sacrifice to the Lord. You're here today to worship. That's good. They went to worship, and then God was going to show them and take the the blinders off their eyes so they could see who the next king would be. Continuing on verse 5. They consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Verse 6. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely this, this is the Lord's anointed one. You have Samuel. A man of God looking at one of the sons and saying, surely this must be the one. He's tall. He's handsome. Look at the muscles on him. He dresses right. He looks right. He doesn't wear glasses. He's got the full package. Surely this is the one the Lord's going to anoint before us. Verse 7. But God said, do not look, Samuel, at his appearance or even at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord, don't miss this, for the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. So Jesse brought another son, Benadab. And made him pass before Samuel. Maybe this is the one. And Samuel said, neither has the Lord chosen him. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen him. Thus, Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen him. Do you have any more sons? The seventh son, the youngest son, was David. What was David doing? He was out herding the sheep. Too young for a real responsibility. Put him with the sheep to watch the sheep. My other sons are going to do what's important. God came into this world as the shepherd to take care and watch and save the sheep. Symbolically represents us. God chose David who is shepherding the sheep who resembles us and made him king. Verse 11, and Samuel said to Jesse, 
Are all these young men here? And then he said, there remains one, the youngest. And he is there keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, well, bring him in. I mean, he wasn't even important to bring in at the time. When, when Samuel came and said, bring all your sons. Jesse's, Jesse's thinking, it can't be, it can't be David. It's got to be one of these other sons. They're all thinking the same thing. Even Samuel, except for God. So he went, brought him in, David. He was ruddy, had color on his face, with bright eyes, and he was good looking. And the Lord said, arise, Samuel, anoint this one. Samuel took the oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the spirit of the Lord fell upon David from that day forward. Wow. Israel chose King Saul, who walked away from God and did not follow God's commandments. He did at times. God rejected him, chose himself a king, someone no one else would have chosen, not even his own family. You know, if we talk about love, we look at the world's perspective, not only is that unequally yoked, but it's unhealthy. The world's perspective is wrong. God's love is not so much that we love ourselves as that we love others. Remember when Jesus was tested there in Matthew 22? Tell us, which ones are the greatest commandment, Lord? Which ones? Of the 10 here, which ones? Or the Moses 631 laws, which laws are the most important? God took the 10 commandments and put them to two. Love your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. And when you do that, Don't miss this. I know you're probably getting tired now. And when you do that, you'll be able to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But you'll never be able to love your neighbor as you love yourself unless you first love God first. Saul had walked away and stopped worshiping God. His love was now tainted. His vision of the future was Israel was tainted. He had disobeyed God. Rules and regulations are to protect us. The Bible says spiritual things are spiritually discerned. So what's the difference in that? I believe it's a heart thing. Where our heart is affects our eyesight and our vision. Where our heart is affects our eyesight and our vision. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. The S-U-N. The sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because I see everything else. Turn that now symbolically. Think about it. The sun has risen, S-O-N, and I believe it because I can see everything else. God's created being. So what's your vision today? How do we get 2020 vision? How do we get spiritual vision? I think that's a great example. If Christ and the cross is not in the middle, our vision will be tainted. Our perspective will be off. What we call loving others will not be love. It will be selfish love. Often we do for others what we can get in return. All these things I have done too. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching to myself. We have done things for what we can get in return. But true 2020 vision is loving others the way Christ has loved us. And seeing past our outer appearance, titles, and seeing what Christ has placed upon their heart. I'm gonna share a verse with you that I don't like. Let's go to Jeremiah 17, 9. I don't like everything the Bible says, but I believe it. Often we only pick the verses we want to say, the verses that feel good, the verses that maybe uplift us. And there's nothing wrong with picking things that bring us hope. Every week when I have a sermon, my goal is to bring you hope with a capital H, hope and encouragement. We already have a discourager out there, the devil, and we are here to bring hope. Last uh, Sabbath... 
as Pastor Edder was preaching, I received a call and a text about a, a death of a loved one. Bonnie Plyer passed. Many of you may not know her, but she and Bob came to this church for a while. Bob is here today. Thank you, Bob, for coming and Bob's family. He asked to see a pastor. Centralia didn't have a pastor right now. I went over to be with Bob. You know, it's interesting when you deal with death. I don't like talking about death, but I often talk about death. And the reason why I talk about death is this, because I want to bring hope. If I'm not bringing hope, then what am I bringing? However, that's a challenge to bring hope when you're talking about death. Because there's a lot of unanswered questions that I don't understand. And I'm asking for God to give me that vision that only he can give. So as I left church, I was driving over to the house. And I was praying, Lord, may I say what you want me to say, but I imagine you want me to listen more than say anything. Often we say the wrong things. We mean well by what we say when someone passes, but we say the wrong things. When my mom lost her sister, one of my mom's best friends came up to her, put her arm around her and says, I know how you feel. I lost my horse this year. My mom was greatly offended. She meant well. The lady meant well. She loved her horse. I love my animals. The difference is we all grieve differently. So we have to be careful on how we tell people to grieve. Let them grieve the way they need to grieve. It's best just to sit with them and pray with them, and encourage them. Bob was graciously there. He opened the door. I went in. Bonnie was there, peacefully resting in Jesus. You know, there's something about the peace of death. They're resting. They're not being challenged by sin anymore. They're not being attacked by the devil anymore. They're not having the craziness of life that you and I are living. She was resting. However, this is a challenge. For us that remain alive, that miss her and love her and want to be with her. That time frame that we need to wait until someday, through the grace of Jesus and the blood of Christ, we are reconnected with Bonnie. So Bob and I and the family sat on the couch. I tried to listen. We prayed. I claimed a few Bible verses. But often when you're in the midst of grieving, your perspective is... It's hard to see, is it not? It's hard to see as that loved one. 66 years of marriage has passed. As the funeral home knocked on the door, and they really did everything right as much as they could. They were very gracious and kind. The hardest part for me of the passing of my loved one was watching them remove the body. As they put your loved one in that bag and they zip it up and you hear each one zip, each click. Whatever the news says about this world right now vanished from my perspective. The, importance, the important part was bringing hope and believing it myself, in which I do. I believe Bob will be reunited with Bonnie. I believe I'll be reunited with my loved ones. I believe many of you will be reunited with your loved ones. The challenge is our perspective today, living in the challenging world that we live in. What is your 2020 vision? Many people have said to me that have lived much longer than me, Pastor John, I've never seen anything like the world we live in now. I listen to our elders because they have experience. You know, for those of us that think we have, ex we may be smart, book smart, but there's something to be said about life experience. If you talk to someone in their 70s, 80s, or 90s, their wisdom is beyond means. Their life experiences, and I've had those conversations over the last few months, and they have said the same thing, and I'm listening. I have never seen happen what is happening now. Let's do a quick review for 2020. I got a timeline for you. January 2, a third state of emergency was called in New South Wales as Australia and bushfires threatened the south coast of the country. Do you remember that? Brand new year, January 2, and Australia is on fire. January 7, the World 
health organization is notified of the novel coronavirus found in China. Some people thought about it, not other people, nah, it's not a big deal. January 8, Iran launches ballistic missiles at two military bases in Iraq, injuring American soldiers. January 11, China records its first coronavirus death. Now, this is not all the news. This is just a little timeline. If I tried to show you all the news for 2020, we'd be here all day. January 16, the impeachment trial for the President Donald Trump begins. Who's the President of our United States? Donald Trump. Whether you agree or not, the impeachment of it, that's a pretty big deal. Wow. January 20, the first coronavirus case in the U.S. reported in Washington State where we live. That's getting awful close to home now, people. I'm feeling a little bit uncomfortable. Did anyone see that coming in the new year? Did anyone anticipate that? Did you have 2020 vision? This is the year of 2020 perfect vision. How's your vision? Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. January 23, China, the epic center of the coronavirus, goes under an unprecedented lockdown, impacting 11 million residents. 11 million. January 26, Kobe Bryant and Gigi Bryant, along with seven other passengers, die in a helicopter crash. Kobe Bryant's a great basketball player, well known for his skills in basketball. February 5, Trump is acquitted by the Senate on both accounts of impeachment. Do we live in a world of uncertainty? I mean, you know, is, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's a government disaster, whether it's a church disaster, whether it's a human disaster, it is all around us. March 10, Italy becomes the first country to implement a nationwide lockdown. March 11, the WHO declares the coronavirus a pandemic. That means worldwide, different from worldwide. March 13, Trump declares a nation, a national emergency amid the coronavirus pandemic. Shortly after, the world is on lockdown. March 16, the Dow Jones plunges 3,000 points, affecting all our monetary income. March 19 through 24, a large portion of the United States went into lockdown. March 24, I love the Olympics. The 2020 Summer Olympics are postponed. By the way, the GC was canceled. The NID, NAD was canceled. All these trips these pastors were going to go on for the 2020 vision to encourage us were canceled. Church was canceled. March 26, billions, not millions, billions of people were on the same form of lockdown and estimated 90% of the world's population. Wow, 90%. We're all on the same page of this pandemic. April 9, the state of New York alone has the highest number of coronavirus deaths more than any other state or country. May 25, well, even before that, how about the murder hornets? Seriously? They're going to talk about the murder hornets? The ones that go out and sting us and we die from them? Anything else that can be thrown at us? I mean, are we ever going to get a break to get up? Do you feel like you're sinking in the water and you just need that breath and you're trying to reach up but you can't get to it? They even said the coronavirus. I met someone yesterday who had the coronavirus, she and her husband. And they're both well now, by the way. She said it was a lot like the flu. She said, I had a fever. Then I had a hard time breathing. Not a big deal. It's scary, but sort of like you're drowning. She said, I had a hard time getting my breath. Then I got better and we're well. Why does it take some people's lives and not others? I don't know. I don't know. May 25, the heinous killing of George Floyd. We all saw that. June, the unfortunate condemnation of all law enforcement now based on one's actions. Wow, how would you like to be judged by someone else's actions? 138,000 officers are on the street in the United States. There's going to be some bad decisions, but... Let's just get rid of them all now. Where is your heart today? Jeremiah 17, 9. This is our heart. Oh, man, this is a hard verse to read. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Brothers and sisters, that's our heart. That's our heart. 
Do you think we know what liberty is and justice is and freedom is? Our heart is wicked. Our perspectives are tainted. It doesn't matter what glasses you wear. It doesn't matter what color you are. It doesn't matter what you know and don't know. It matters who you know and who you've given your heart to. Or is it just yours? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I'm glad the Lord does not stop there. Verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. And give to those men according and women according to the fruit of their doing. Praise the Lord that the Lord is the one that judges our heart. I believe with all my heart Jesus has seen what is happening today. And I believe his heart is breaking. I had a lunch with Dave Shelton today. Or I'm sorry, maybe you can come over for lunch today. But I had a lunch with Dave Shelton this week. And it was interesting. You know, he didn't know what I was writing on the sermon. And even I didn't know. I actually wrote four different sermons. Didn't finish them all. I had bits and pieces of four different sermons. Because my heart and my mind and my perspective is probably a lot like yours right now. What do you talk about? Dave said something that made a real impact on me. We're eating lunch. We had a time of prayer. And he said, I, my perspective is this. He didn't know what I was writing on. I want to bring a smile to God's face. Am I bringing a smile to God's face? Are you bringing a smile to God's face? I believe God's heart is breaking. In 2 Chronicles 16... Verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. God's eyes, his perspective is running to and fro. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. Throughout the whole earth, he wants to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Brothers and sisters, I believe you're here today because you're loyal to him. I believe that. Only God knows your heart. But I believe that. And says God is running to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Well, Pastor John, what about an eye for an eye? The Bible talks about that, an eye for an eye. Don't you say all biblical word is inspired? It is. But we often take things out of context. As I'm coming to enclose, I want to go to that verse. So go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And let's see what the Bible says about an eye for an eye. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. God's word says, you've heard it, you've heard it, that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I'm seeing that today. But Jesus says, this is Jesus speaking, I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him also the other cheek. Wow, that's hard. We read this, but do we think about it? If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your coat too. Verse 41, whoever compels you to go one mile with him, go two. Verse 42, Give to him or her who asks of you. And from him who wants to borrow something from you, do not turn it away. Not just your friends. It's easy to give to our friends. We love our friends. What about the people we don't like? I didn't like the guy in the street this week. I didn't know him, but I didn't like him. God changed my heart, though. I did pray for him. And I prayed for myself. I said, Lord, I want your heart. I want to see that crazy guy, whoever's behind that wheel in heaven. Because only you can change his heart. And if I'm not praying for him and lifting him up in prayer, providing hope to him, what am I doing? Every person has great value in God's eyes because they're all God's children. Even that guy in the car waving his fists and hand at me. Give to him. Verse 43. 
You've heard it said, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Lord, do I have to read this and swallow this? I got to pray for them? That you may be sons and daughters of the Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good. That means God blesses them both. The day the sun came up, not just for the good, but also for the evil people. So they could see. If you love those who love you, what reward have you? Don't even tax collectors do that? We all have our cliques. We all have people we're comfortable with. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying you can't be friends with your friends. I'm saying true friendship, though, is loving people that are unlovable. Loving people that don't even want to be loved. Loving people... All right. I want to close with this thought. We are all tremendously busy. We are too busy. Someone said to me this week, wow, you're really going to be busy since Pastor Edder's gone. I am, and I miss him. There was many blessings in ministry, and there's many challenges in ministry. We're all too busy. It comes down to this. 2020 is a census year. Christ was born in a census year. Remember? A census year where they count the numbers of the people. Remember the census being done on Christ? A census counts and values the people. I pray that God holds my heart and will create in me that 2020 eyesight. The verse I often quote day in and day out, Psalms 51.10, O oh Lord, create in me a clean new heart. Because once I have that clean new heart, then I can pray for somebody else. But if my heart is wicked beyond belief, then I will only condemn that other person. I have to have the vision of God. To love God the way people love, he loves God. Well, I said that wrong. To love God the way Jesus loves people. Don't you want that? To see The way Jesus loves Ryan, Ryan is a good friend of mine, I want to love Ryan that way. I want to have that same love that only Jesus has and will only happen with a heart that comes from God. Samuel saw all of Jesse's sons. Samuel was the priest. He was the pastor. They all walked in front of him before David and Samuel chose wrong. The father of all the sons, Jesse, picked the wrong one. Only God can can transform our hearts and make us into the image that represents him. Ellen G. White said, worry is blind and cannot discern the future, but Jesus sees the end from the beginning. Will you, will I go to the great physician to let him correct our eyesight. In the year 2020, will you join me in asking for God to create in you and me a new heart? I am praying for 2020 eyesight. For Jesus and all of heaven will be a sight worth seeing. The Bible says, eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has in store for those that love him with all their hearts. Let's say a closing prayer. Dear Lord, as we close, we want to uplift the name of Jesus Christ. We're asking for your vision. We're asking for your heart. We're asking to follow you. I'm asking your blessings not only on my church family that are here. Lord, I love each one. Each face that I see today, I love. But Lord, may I pray for the people that are hard to love, for the people that I don't want to love, for the people that challenge me in my walk to see you. I could justify all their wrongs in my mind, but Lord, you could justify all the wrongs that I've done in your mind. 
Lord, if we're guilty of one sin, we're guilty of them all. As the prodigal son, Lord, you gave him your robe of righteousness. I pray that each of us ask that of you today. Will you make us whole and give us that 2020 vision that only you can give? In Jesus' precious name and all God's people said, amen.